Hi folks and welcome to our next in our series of webinars. Today's is best practices for an affordable web presence and your facilitator today is Ashley Boucher who is the coordinator of systems and technology here at the Cody Institute. Today he's going to talk about a quick overview of some of the options uh, in terms of web presence and discuss um, social media versus websites and also give a brief overview of some hosting options, domains and what's known as SSL. And he'll then also cover a little bit about content management systems such as uh, WordPress and talk about themes and plugins. So before we get started, I'm just going to give you a wee bit of an overview of Collaborate. You'll notice that down at the bottom right hand side of your screen, there is a purple triangle. If you click on that, you will be able to expand the menu and you'll see where there's a chat bubble and you can communicate, you can ask questions to Ashley uh, as he's doing his session. You can also take a peek at the middle of your screen below the PowerPoint slide. You'll notice that there is a microphone icon and a webcam. I'll be turning my webcam off as soon as I'm done speaking, um, but I will turn his on and we'll keep it on until, um, until we realize that bandwidth isn't quite as good and then we'll see if he has to turn it off. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and you'll notice there's a hand icon. It's the fourth one to the right. And when you have that question, if you'd like to use your microphone to ask the question, one click or one tap on the microphone icon will activate it. But we ask that when you're done, you do turn off your microphone to uh, help with bandwidth and to decrease a lot of the background noise. So this session is being recorded and the recording will be available in Cody Connects and also on the Cody International Institute's um, YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Ashley. Thanks so much, Wendy. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I might forego the, the camera just to avoid any hiccups. People really want to see me. I guess I can turn it on if the demand is there. But um, so yeah, we'll kick things off. Uh, Wendy gave a bit of an intro there at the beginning as to what we'll be talking about. I'll take a few seconds, not much of the time, just to chat about uh, about myself because I I'm rather new to Cody. I started in January of this year, but prior to that, I had about 10 years experience in economic development. Uh, with a couple of local NGOs here in the province. Um, and then I did move on and spent four years dedicated to web content and design and creation. So when you and I were chatting, she figured I might be a good fit to do a little bit of a webinar just to kind of bring people up to speed on what's happening out there in relation to website, website design, and uh, kind of the difference between that and social media and ways that small nonprofit organizations can save themselves some dollars when it comes to their presence on the web. So if that sounds good to folks, that's that's kind of where we'll head. Uh, I'll take I can take small breaks between some of the sections of the presentation. If people have questions, they can put their hand up and go from there. Uh, also, at the end of it, I'll be I'll be open for any kind of questions or discussion. So we'll kick things off. Let me know if you can't hear me or if there's any kind of issues, Wendy will probably ping me if she notices anything. So building on what Wendy said today, I think we'll chat a little bit about the differences between a website and social media. Um, once we kind of get through that and through the social media talk, we'll talk about uh, some of the more affordable options when it comes to designing, hosting, and maintaining uh, a web presence and a website. Uh, I'll get into some of the boring details. I'll try not to get too deep into them, but uh, if people want me to go deeper, then, then that's fine as well. Uh, we'll chat about security and SSLs, which are becoming a bit more essential in today's climate, whether they need to be or not is up for debate. It doesn't really matter. Google, Chrome, some of the big players deem them necessary, so we'll chat about that. Um, Many of the websites you will create today or maintain today are kind of built with something called a content management system or CMS for short. So I'll cover some of the biggies out there, but probably focus on WordPress as it's easily the most popular CMS out there. 
a bit of a wrap up and then some questions. If anybody's got any questions, they want to throw their hand up, I'll try to make note of it and stop and answer. All right, so your web presence today is kind of broken into, as far as I see it, two major areas. You've got a website, um, which is rather traditional, and then there's the social media side of things, which is pretty much traditional at this point, too. It's It's been around long enough that it's not going anywhere, and it's, it's something that should be considered when talking about your presence online. Uh, the difference, the, the big difference between the two is I see a website being more of a an information repository. It's where the nuts and bolts of your organization can live online. It doesn't constantly turn over like a social media feed. It doesn't constantly change. It's a place you can house documents. It's a place you can house information that's rather static most of the time, can still be updated easily, but it's not updated multiple times a day like a social media feed would be. Um, some of the pros of the website versus social media would be your website's not competing with anything else in a social media feed. If someone is perusing whatever you're up to on Facebook, they kind of have to deal with everything else that's happening in Facebook and their attention may be diverted away from what you want them to pay attention to. With a website, you're in control of that content and you're kind of in control of what the audience has before them. Um, there's no external factors they're really affecting that when they're staring at a website as opposed to staring at a Facebook feed. Um, like I said earlier, there a few minutes ago, it, it's, it's a great place to store information. Storing information in a social media environment is a little tricky because that's not what it's intended for. It's, it's not a repository, it's not a library, it's not a collection. It's, it's a news feed for the most part where you're sharing things that are very of the moment. A website it's a good place to house your strategic documents, your staffing information, your contact information, even a calendar of events, stuff like that, that you control and that doesn't change as often as a social media feed would. The biggest con, if there's a con with a website, is it does require action from your audience. Your audience has to visit the website and check in on things, whether it's events, an events calendar, news releases, um, press releases, anything like that. It requires the audience to enter your URL into Chrome, visit it, take a look around, read what they want to read, and leave. You, it, it takes effort on them. So sometimes, uh, you know, your audience is probably checking their social media feed multiple times a day. They're probably checking your website multiple times a week, maybe just multiple times a month. So it, like I said, it takes effort on them and relying on them to get that message isn't an option. So when it comes to social media, social media allows you to push content to people. Basically, they've agreed to like your page or follow you on Instagram or follow you on Twitter. So when you put information out, it gets fed to them. Now there's algorithms in place that dictate you know, how much of that they see, but at least they've signed up to see it. And there's a very good chance that that social media platform will feed them what you put out. So it requires no effort on them. They're on their smartphone, they're on their computer, they're flicking through their social media. They'll happen to catch what you put out, maybe take a second to read it. But like I said, as a con of social media, they will move on to the next thing. But at least your it requires less effort from them to see that content. Um, it's usually quite fresh, it's participatory. Um, when it comes to Facebook or Twitter or social media, it allows you to have conversations with folks. Uh, that you may not have through a website or or any other kind of correspondence. So it's usually fresh, it's usually relevant, it allows for commenting, it allows for discussion, which is good and bad. Sometimes you know it requires a lot of moderation when it comes to to that discussion or moderating your social media accounts in general. Um, so keep that in mind if you're going to go full force with social media campaigns unless you shut down participation altogether and make it a one-way street you may have to interact with folks um, you know calm the waters from time to time if need be um, just keep an eye on things and then there the final bullet on this slide talks a bit about mobile responsiveness once again you know it's not it's not new news that that your website or your social media 
should be looking great on a tablet, on a computer, on a, on a smartphone, whatever it may be. Social media apps will take care of the social media side of things. It takes you know really no effort on you. But if you're designing a new website today, you need to make sure that it's that it's mobile responsive, and that simply means that no matter the screen size or the device that's viewing the content, it looks good. Um, Ten years ago, mobile responsiveness wasn't a big deal. Websites were pretty plain, and uh, they may have looked quite terrible on a website because words were getting cut off or tables weren't working, but most of the content management systems I'll talk about a bit later in this presentation handle that mobile responsiveness quite well for you. But you do have to keep it in mind that, you know, 60% of your web traffic may be from a mobile device. Um, so really, you should be tailoring to them as opposed to the desktop users at this point. But uh, there's ways to curate information for both. Today's chat was going to be more about websites, but I will spend, you know, a slide and a bit chatting about uh, about social media tools. There are many. I have named just a few here, and they're the biggies, right? They're the ones that you really, you know, you cannot ignore. Um, once again, that strength being that it feeds information to people if they choose to follow you, and it makes sharing that information quite easy as well. Let's say you don't have a website at all and you just focus on your social media, getting your content out there, that's great. Um, the tools are very easy to use. The folks in your current organization may have no trouble at all using them. Um, you know, little learning curve when it comes to when it comes to these apps. There are many social media platforms out there, and there are apps out there that'll kind of let you manage them all at the same time. Something like Hootsuite. I didn't throw a picture in here, but it's an app that, you know, if you want to post to Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram with one click, it'll let you do it. So it cuts down on that labor and the work that it takes to, uh, to, make, things, to make things happen on all of your platforms. And once again, you know, a lot of the organizations we may be targeting and a lot of people we may be targeting may have a voice and they may want it heard and social media is a great way to let that happen. But once again, just keep in mind that you, you, you may have to moderate that and just keep an eye on things, but it couldn't be easier for people to interact with you through social media. And if I'm flying through this too fast, stop me. That's, that's fine. We can, we can have a chat about something. So, if we're going to move on to websites and chatting about websites today, there's a few things I kind of want to drive home. There are two ways to obtain a website. You know, you create it yourself in house, um, or you get someone external to the organization, an agency, a marketing agency, a web design firm to create the website for you, or somewhere in the middle where the design firm may build the skeleton, may put the bones in place, but you put the, you know, the flesh on those bones and you fill out that website as time goes on. It depends on your organization which one of those options is best for you. Um, a smaller organization with not a lot of staff that they can dedicate to something like a website, it may be best just to go outside, uh, work with an agency outside who gets you um, gets your mission and your vision and your goals and works with you to, you know, develop a web presence that reflects those. If you're going to go with someone external, your next choice is, you know, large firms or small firms because there are numerous of either one of them. Uh, large firms may handle, you know, larger clients, bigger organizations. They may handle everything from website to social media, smaller firms maybe much smaller staffed, but able to afford a bit more focus to you. They may not offer everything a larger firm does, but the trade-off would be that chances are the smaller firm's costs may be less than engaging a larger firm. And once again, it all depends on what works for your organization, what works for your budget, what works for the staff that you have on hand at the time. Um, you as an organization will know best what what the best solution is there. Um, if you did decide that you were going to try and tackle this on your own, 
um, or even engage a, an outside agency. There are off the shelf solutions and there are custom solutions and then there's everything in between. An off the shelf solution would be something like Squarespace. I don't know if folks have heard of it, probably. Um, or Wix would be another biggie. They're very simple, point and click. What you see is what you get. Creates a website, no problem. I think one of the limitations of something like that is the minute you want to get a bit more specialized or offer something that's outside of their templates, it gets tricky. And that's where that sliding scale starts to slide towards, you know, something that's a bit more custom created for you. Um, it can be 100% custom created for you, or it can be built on something like a content management system where that system handles a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the background work, and then you tack on things that you need. Um, both of them are very viable options. Uh, it depends again on the organization, the budget, um, the staff that you've got, and where and what you want that website to do. Some people just require a very simple website, a very simple web presence. They can get by with a pretty simple content management system or an off-the-shelf product. If they've got things like online shopping or uh, resource catalogs or collections of things that need to be searched and accessed, you're getting a bit out of the scope of something that's off the shelf and you'll just have to work with somebody to build that solution for you. Um, if you're going outside and chatting with another agency, you want to make sure that you're on the same page as they are and that they get what you are after and what you're looking to do. It'll mean that much more when they're working with you and when they're designing things for you, if they've got similar passions as you do. Uh, when picking some, when you're picking an outside firm, chat to, chat to your peers, talk to other organizations who carry out the same kind of activities as you do. What do they do? What did they do? Who did they engage? What route did they go on that scale of, you know, uh, off the shelf versus custom solution? If you're going inside, your own organization and you're going to get your own team to build things, um, that's great, but you've got to make sure that you've got the staff that can tackle it and realize that there's a cost to that. Um, yeah, we're going to build our own website. We don't need to pay X amount of dollars to external agency. We're just going to build it, except we're going to pay one of our perhaps highly paid employees to build that site um, when they could be doing other things with their time. You just, you've got to look at what works best for you. So this is the boring part that I mentioned in the agenda. Um, we'll talk a bit about domain names and hosting. So if you think about domain names and hosting, I would use the analogy of a house. Uh, a domain name is the address of the host, so it's 123 Main Street. Um, your hosting is your house and the contents of it. They are two distinct things, often purchased together and often, they're often tied together, but they are two separate items entirely. Um, so, to, you know, to, just to expand on that a little bit, that domain name is the URL of your website. It's the www.mywebsite.com. The cost of having your own domain um, shouldn't be a whole bunch. It should be, you know, I've got $20 Canadian there a year and that should be it. If you're paying more than that for it, I'm not quite sure what you're paying for unless it's some real custom uh, URLs. Quite often when using an outside agency, they'll purchase a domain for you. They'll purchase hosting for you, but both will be marked up because they've got to make some money too. But keep in mind that, you know, $20 a year will get you a domain. If you're paying $100 a year for that domain, I think you might be overpaying, but that's that's my two cents, I guess. And, and everybody's gonna make a living when they're, when they're designing websites. Um, they're purchased from a domain registrar and leased year to year. So you never truly own the domain, you lease it year to year, and it's at the discretion of a registrar. They could take that away from you if you were violating certain aspects of the law or whatever it is. It, it, you do not own it. Um, and when you go to purchase that domain, you may find that the domain you want or the domain that's your business or organization's name is already taken because guess what? 
another organization wants it, it pertains to them, they own it. It's very difficult to say that you're entitled to a certain domain. So sometimes you've just got to think a little bit outside the box with your domains. And I'll speak from a Canadian stance. If you are purchasing a domain and you know it's Cody.com, then make sure you buy Cody.ca as well, because your audience may try either one of those and you don't want them heading to the wrong website. You also don't want to buy Cody.com to discover someone behind you buys Cody.ca and does whatever they wish with it. So the same would apply to many country domains that, you know, try to purchase your local country domain as long as the dot, as long as well as the dot com. And if you want the dot net, the dot org, you know, they all are $20 a piece. You could buy as many domains as you wish, but try to cover your basis with the audience that'll be hitting your website, basically. So hosting, like I said, is your host and kind of the contents of your host. It's a, it's a physical server in a building somewhere where your files reside. And it usually that physical server shared with other websites, maybe hundreds of other websites, but it's a place where the PDFs, the images, the text, all that stuff lives on that server. Um, price points for something like that depend. Uh, if you've got a website that sees, you know, thousands of visitors a day for whatever reason, you probably can't skimp out on hosting costs. If you're a website that doesn't have that much traffic, you can usually get away with something that's, you know, once again, Canadian dollars, but $120 a year will get you a hosting plan that can handle hundreds of visitors a day, I think, um, and maybe a bit more than that in crunch times. Once again, it's a sliding scale. You can go from, you know, $10 a month to 50 or $100 a month, depending on your needs. Most hosting companies, if you engage them, they'll kind of let you know, well, here's the traffic you should expect, or here's the traffic you currently get, here's the plan that best matches up with you. And if you underestimate that and you need more horsepower, they'd be happy to sell it to you. But, you know, a lot of small organizations, uh, especially local ones, could probably get away with, with a hosting cost of $120 a year and a domain cost of $20 a year. So, you know, with tax, whatever, you're in $150 a year to have that hosting and that domain and it need not cost $500 a year. Um, it can cost, you know, like I said, $150 or less. Uh, you can usually buy a domain and hosting at the same time from the same company. It'll save you some headaches if you do it that way because they'll be able to handle the linking on the back end and make sure that everything works as it should be. But you don't have to purchase them at the same same place. That's it's either way will work. It's just a bit easier if they if they both belong with the same company. Um, once again, I, I would say avoid using a middleman, middle person, middle woman. Um, have a direct relationship with your host or your registrar. And that's not to say that uh, your marketing agency isn't trustworthy, but that agency may not exist for forever. Or your relationship with them may not exist for forever. And I've seen quite a few clients whose um, web designer or friend they know or uncle they have, whatever, has the keys to the kingdom when it comes to their domain and their hosting. And that person, for whatever reason, is no longer available. Well, everything's tied to that external person. It's not tied to you and your organization. So I could offer you a piece of advice. It would be to um, make that relationship yourself, pay for that hosting and domain yourself. You can then hand over the username and password and account details to whoever's designed your website, but make sure that information is tied to your email address, your phone number, your credit card even, because then if for some reason you and the designer just aren't getting along or the designer is given up, you know, doing that type of thing, you have the keys to the kingdom. You can take and go anywhere you need to rather than being held hostage or spending a couple of months trying to get ownership of a domain that you thought you owned all along. So we'll talk a little bit about security and SSLs. So an SSL certificate, uh, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer. And up until probably two years ago, it really didn't matter that much. Um, the websites that did have SSLs, and you could tell because they said HTTPS, 
at the beginning instead of HTTP, um, they'd be Amazon, they'd be the Royal Bank, they'd be anybody that's kind of processing money or handling really secure information. They, they should have an SSL in place, well, and they would have. Um, lately, Google Chrome and Google itself, who, you know, whether you like it or not, owns a pretty large percent of, of, of that highway that people use to access your websites, have decided that HTTPS and SSL certificates are important to all websites, more or less. They'd like to see every website have HTTPS and that SSL in place. Whether you're handling super secret information or handling money or not, it really doesn't matter to them. So what they've started to do, and that little graphic is kind of tiny, so I don't know if you can see it, but you'll see a little warning that says this site is not secure, or a little gray box that you know asks you to click on it and see that it's not secure. Um, it'll scare people away. Whether or not it, it's truly needed doesn't really matter because users will see, oh my God, I'm on a site, the computer just told me it's not secure, uh, they must have a virus, I better get over here. True or not, doesn't really matter. Um, you should have that in place. And Google's going a few more steps farther that if you've got an SSL in place, you'll perform better in search results and you'll be better liked by, you know, the bots that crawl uh, on behalf of Google. So there was a time when it wasn't essential, but I think it is. That being said, uh, a simple SSL can be free. Uh, there's a nonprofit, I think, based out of California called Let's Encrypt, and they offer free SSLs. You just have to renew them yearly, much like a domain. Um, you put them in place, they get renewed, and they give your audience and your visitors and your the people you're trying to reach, you know, a bit more security when they're visiting your site that they, they don't need to worry. Um, the site that's in place is secure. You guys, you know, the organization has taken steps to make sure that it's secure. And with it being free of charge, why not? That being said, hosting companies will sell you one as well, or maybe even offer it for free through Let's Encrypt. Um, but once again, an SSL, 20, 30 bucks a year, not a huge expense. Now, if you were handling super secret information, financial information, uh, you may need a bit beefier of an SSL because they do exist. You know, there's simple ones and then more complex ones. And that cost could go up. It could be a hundred bucks a year. It could be more than that. Um, but that would depend on what you're doing as a nonprofit or an NGO, if you need something that high level. As with most things, try not to be oversold on an SSL. Yes, you need one, um, but most likely you need the least expensive one that they offer. So you can kind of go from there. So I said we would talk about content management systems, and here we are, content management system, CMS for short. Uh, CMS, they've been around for quite some time now, but there was a time when such a thing didn't exist, and it was kind of a real pain in the butt to make a website. Uh, I'm still not going to say it's not a pain in the butt, but CMS makes it a bit easier. Um, so what CMS does is it uses something called CSS, and boring again, uh, cascading style sheet is what CSS stands for. So a content management system kind of lets you put a bunch of rules in place, design rules. Um, every time somebody types, it will be this color and the font will be this size on the website. Every time there's a heading, it will be this big and it will be this color. Anytime things are bolded, they're bolded this much. Anytime a picture is put on a page, it looks like this. Um, you set those rules once, and then you're free to create as many pages or as many posts um, or as many pieces of information as you like without worrying about designing it all. You just type it out, and more or less of what you see is what you get editor, and the CMS takes care of how things should look, makes them look properly, makes them work properly within the website, links work properly, menu items work. It just works. It's It really opened up. I think the ability for people to kind of handle this stuff a bit more on their own, other than being at the mercy of someone external to the organization. Like I mentioned earlier, even if that agency builds the, the CSS for you, builds those design rules, and then turns it over to you, just like you can work in a Word document or send an email, you just type things out, you hit update, you hit publish, you hit save, 
and it's on the internet and it's done. You didn't have to worry about anything design related whatsoever. It's pretty sharp. It's, it's made a big difference, I think, in the web development community and, uh, and the web design community. There are, I would imagine, hundreds of content management systems. It would be safe to say that WordPress is number one and probably is 80% of that market, if not more. Uh, Drupal, Joomla, there's a few others out there that do exist. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I use WordPress. I like WordPress. And if someone asked me what content management system to use, I'd say WordPress in a heartbeat. And it's because of its popularity. It's super well supported by, you know, thousands of developers out there. Um, Google's your friend if you're having trouble with WordPress. WordPress is, is by far the easiest um, system to use right from the get-go. And then if you do need to reach out, like I said, Google and the developers out there, uh, the answers are out there. So, you, you know, a lot of this, it's almost like nothing is impossible with it for the most part, right? Um, you can use WordPress and it's pretty bare bones, um, static format with nothing real fancy, or you can build onto it with things called plugins, uh, themes, that allow you to dictate that design and style a bit more and allow you to do things like online shopping a bit easier, like a library, like a collection. Um, whatever you needed to do, you can, you can pretty much make it to do. A lot of people will get confused between wordpress.com and WordPress. WordPress is the content management system. Anybody can download it. It's free to use. You can implement it on your website. WordPress.com is kind of the commercial arm of that where if you want to create a blog, you sure can. You can do it for free through WordPress.com without using your own domain. You can pay WordPress a bit and use your own domain. But when working with WordPress.com, it's much more off the shelf. So it's going to allow for a lot less customization than taking the nonprofit version of the software, which is just regular old WordPress, and implementing it yourself. Um, so people will often think well, WordPress is just for blogging. E, it started out that way, but really it powers a huge percentage of websites on the internet today. So it's not just for blogs, it's, it's become a fully fledged web development tool. So not to sound like a sales person, but I'll continue to, uh, to talk about WordPress. WordPress is open source, so anybody can contribute to it. Anybody can build plugins for it and themes for it. And there's, you know, and nobody owns it. There's no proprietary issues there. People who build themes and plugins and add-ons and stuff like that, they can they can charge for it. Certainly built on WordPress, but the core of WordPress itself is open source and it's free. And I'm pretty sure it always will be. Um, I talk about theme templates. You you know you do a quick Google. It says there's over 14,000, and those would be free. Um, I'd say there's that many more that you can pay for, and it's not a huge expense either. It may be a $60 one-time fee to get a really slick theme that you like, that you don't have to tweak, that suits your needs just perfectly, and then you just install that theme, check a box, tell it to activate, and then your content looks the way you like it to. Plugins are those add-ons that let you do almost anything with WordPress, whether it's online subscriptions or online shopping or or user, you know, private areas for users, you know, security issues, um, search engine optimization issues, anything like that can be handled by some of these plugins. Um, and when I mentioned search engine optimization, I should have threw a slide in here, but I didn't, but I'll take two seconds to talk about it. Uh, WordPress and any of those other content management systems would play nice for the most part um, with search engine optimization or SEO. And what that does is creates content, creates URLs, does things behind the scenes that make sure Google is happy, likes your website, and kind of bumps it to the top of search results relative to your competition anyway. Um, so there'd be really no concern when it comes to any of any of these content management systems. They'll handle, they'll handle SEO just fine. Uh, once again, kind of, you know, Word, WordPress is, is my method of choice and, and many others. And if you did work with a developer who was proficient in WordPress and built a bunch of things on top of WordPress, did all their fancy customizations that you required, 
but then they get out of the business for whatever reason, you'd have no problem finding another WordPress developer to kind of step in, take a look at what that person had done, figure it out and pick up from where they left off. It, uh, it really is customizable. It's what the new Cody website is built on. Um, in the past six months, we've kind of picked up the old content that was on the old Cody website, brought it into uh, another content management system, which is WordPress. And, you know, I'd, quite a bit of my time was spent with plugins and with the theme, making the site look exactly how we wanted it to, with, uh, with tweaks to those themes, because once you buy a theme or install it, you can tweak it to your heart's content. If it's not quite what you need it to be, you can transform it into something else. And then the plugins will allow you to add all kinds of functionality to that site um, as well. It is the most popular content management system. So it is the, like Windows, uh, a target of hackers. So know that, but once again, plugins to the rescue. Uh, there's one called WordFence that I would recommend that kind of monitors your site the whole time, lets you know if people are trying to access it maliciously, blocks them, sends you reports on it. Um, so you can kind of sleep well at night knowing that it's that it's protected. Um, with both themes and plugins, there are lots of free ones and then there are lots of paid ones. Usually if you're paying for a theme or you're paying for a plugin, with a theme you're getting some extra niceties that you may not get with standard free themes. With plugins, you're probably getting added functionality. There's usually a free version of the plugin and then a pro version of the plugin that lets you do that much more. Um, usually not huge costs, usually one-time costs. You know, this plugin that you just really need to make this database work properly, it might be $20, you pay it once, you have it for life, you support it for life, and it does what you need it to do. So it's quite nice. So if I had to, I'm pretty, pretty light on the pictures in this PowerPoint, sorry about that, but this is what the visual editor looks like in WordPress. It looks an awful lot like Word or Gmail or Yahoo or Outlook. It's a what you see is what you get editor. You know, you give your page a title, you fill out that content block with whatever you want. You'll see a number of buttons there kind of, you know, just above that white content block that lets you do underlining and bold and bullets and tables and linking and colors and all that kind of stuff if you want to get into that. Um, then there's a blue publish button on the right and your content's published. It, it, it's just it's really that easy. Um, if you want to work with the code, you can, but for the most part, you don't need to. You can stick in there, type what you want, uh, highlight what you want, make it bold, make it underlined, do whatever. Do whatever you need. It's not, it's not scary. It's quite easy. So if an outside firm used WordPress to set you up, create your base content, then you take over from there and create what you want. Uh, within WordPress, there's really two main types of content, although there can be more, but there's pages and posts. Um, pages are static content. They're the, you know, the information that doesn't change a whole lot on your website. You know, you may freshen it up every once in a while, but it's not under constant revision or constant tweaking or constant updating. Um, posts are something different. Posts can be news, events, um, stuff like that, that you want on a bit of a conveyor belt because WordPress is still a blogging tool. So you can set up a bit of a blog that, you know, feeds you the latest piece of news at the top with the older stuff at the bottom falling away into an archive and people can view that archive. But as you're creating posts, know that they're not meant to be um, you know, they're not meant to be in the spotlight for long. They're just an event that's coming up or a news release that you've just done. And a week from now or three days from now, you have a new piece that takes, you know, center stage. The content stays, you can still get to it, but it kind of acts as that, uh, as that continual bits and drabs of information that you want to send out to people. And posts are a great way to generate content that you can then push to your social media profiles. So rather than make a Facebook post that's all wordy and long with links and PDFs, you make a Facebook post that's rather short and concise, but links to the WordPress post on your website. So that way there, you drive traffic to your website. It's kind of the best of both worlds. I should have warned everybody that this would be short. <laughs> so we're on the takeaway slide already, um, but I've got two of them, so you know. Um, 
if I had to drive home a few points, and, and really that's all I did this afternoon, I, I didn't ramble too much, I don't think. Uh, web presence is important. I don't think I need to tell anybody that in today's day and age that you should have a website, you should have a domain. It lends a bit of credibility to you if it's a domain that applies to you rather than, you know, our NGO at gmail.com. Um, having that domain in place is nice. Um, and then tying it to your social media is even nicer. And the two of them, I think, are equally important. And it goes back to that, you know, one's a repository for information, uh, the website, and the social media is kind of the way that you push that content out to people. But the two are tied together pretty closely. Um, cost is a key factor. You can spend way too much um, having a website created, hosted, the domain. Um, I wanted you to know the appropriate amounts. The, I don't know if they're appropriate, but you can get away with paying just that little. You may want to take a look at what your organization is capable of and, and whether or not you know, they can do something um, like handle it themselves because there's a cost to your staff handling it themselves versus having an agency who specialized at doing that. So can, it can swing either way and it's what works best for your organization. But take a look at your peers. In the nonprofit organization, it's not as competitive as the business world. So people should be willing to share with you what they did, what their experience was, who they used, what method they used, what systems they used, and learn from them. Um, and if they're comparable to you, then their solution should also work for you for the most part. Um, like I mentioned before, if you're going to try to do this all yourself or some combination, just make sure your staff are up to speed um, and can handle it. Uh, there may be someone in the organization who already does techie stuff, who already does um, your communications um, production, produces flyers, posters, whatever it may be, they may be keen to handle the web design aspect of it and the content creation. And they may have the time in their schedule to. If you don't have somebody dedicated to those things, or you work with people who you know just know how to do the basics of the computer and survive on that, it may not be best to throw a website at them, even if it is WordPress. They have to kind of have an interest in it and maybe a bit of an inclination towards it as well. Stay in the loop with your developer. If you're going to hire somebody um, from an outside agency, constant contact with them, I think, is key. Um, they're usually pretty busy. They've got a number of clients that they're trying to satisfy. So make sure you kind of stay at the front of that line by you know, shooting them an email, touching base with them. When they touch base with you, it's because you know they've set aside some time to work on your project or your site. So it would be great if you can kind of Take some time, stop, deal with their request so that they can keep that ball rolling because they'll reach out to you and if you can't deal with them right then and you don't touch base with them for three or four weeks, then they've kind of put you on the back burner as well. But if you stay engaged with them and you stay in the loop, they'll tend to stay, you know, they'll tend to reciprocate when, when it comes to that. So, And you'll develop a pretty healthy relationship with them to kind of get where you're coming from and what you want to do and, uh, and work with you to achieve that. So um, another, so I'm going to jump back to social media for two more seconds, and I, I touched on it. It's a blessing and a curse. It allows you to put information out easily. Um, it allows people to communicate back to you easily as well. So just be prepared for that. Um, and you may need to do a little bit of babysitting. And, and it may not be, you know, it may not be super scary, malicious stuff, but it just may be someone who's decided to like your page, but also wants to sell um, their product or just post spam on your on your Facebook page all the time. So just keep that in mind. A bit more back to the website um, side of things. Let me get the slides here advanced. Um, hosting and domains, take control of that. I, if, if nothing else, please purchase your hosting and your domains um, yourself with your credit card and then you have those keys to that kingdom and if you're not happy or your developer disappears you just pick things up and you go somewhere else you find someone else who can work with you and you don't have the headache of having awkward or uncomfortable conversations 
with your de past developer who has all that information and kind of has, you know, has you in their fist. And if they want to squeeze you for money to do that or not bother with you whatsoever, it can put you in quite a dilemma. So SSLs, we had it, but weren't essential, but are now pretty much. I say almost essential, I should just say essential. Um, they don't cost a whole lot. They don't have to cost a whole lot. And having one in place makes Google happy. And whether we like it or not, Google is the internet. So if we keep Google happy, our representation on the internet is that much better off for it. Uh, content management systems make life easier. I don't know of any agency or developer who would in this day and age come to you and say, I don't use a content management system. I do all my coding by hand because why would they? They've just made their life 10 times more difficult. So you really shouldn't run into an instance where you're not using a content management system. But if you are, I would suggest you may see if another developer would be more apt to take you on than someone who says, yeah, I do it all myself and I hard code it myself. There, there's no need of it. There, there, you'd be paying their time when you know things can be done quicker. So. And yeah, I mean, wrapping things up, I don't know if people have questions or discussion about any things we touched on, but uh, sorry, it wasn't a bit longer of a presentation. I just didn't want to get bogged down in things because uh, I could ramble about some of the nitty gritty and the boring stuff for quite some time. But if anybody's got questions, can raise your little hand and then turn on your mic or send it in a, in a little chat bubble there, whatever works for you. I actually have a question about uh, Canadian server or other country servers and wondering what, uh, what some of the service providers for web domains are doing about that. That's a good question, Wendy. It was probably in my notes to talk about, and then I forgot about it. So, um, from a Canadian standpoint, um, there are some instances where you will need to host the information. Now, remember that information is like a host, right? It's it's actual files on a server, and to avoid the prying eyes of, say, the U.S. government, you would need to host that information with a Canadian host and get a guarantee from them that our physical servers are in Canadian borders. They're not anywhere else but Canadian borders. So um, if the FBI or the CIA or Homeland Security, whoever it may be, wants to take a look at your data, they it would be much more difficult for them to do so because that server sits in Canada. It's not on US soil and they don't have as easy an access to it. That being said, if you're not if you're if everything you're hosting is open to the public anyway it's just you know it's promotion of your organization it doesn't have personnel details or anything like that there may be no harm in hosting it wherever you wish um, but there may be cases where you've got to host that stuff on canadian soil or your own nations you know wherever you may be if you don't want to be open to the hosting countries rules and regulations you may want to host it within your home Does that answer your question, Wendy? It does. Many thanks, Ashley. No problem. <clears throat> so I don't know if anybody else got any questions. I don't know if Wendy has a spiel she likes to give at the end of these things. But she's welcome to if no one else has anything else. I actually do have a spiel that I would like to give. <laughs> um, what you're going to see now, folks, uh, both in our live session and in our recording, is a, um, a session evaluation. And I would ask that each one of our participants, either live or in the recording, do take a, uh, do take a minute or two to um, provide some feedback to us. We are using this feedback to uh, improve our own, um, our own work here at the CODI and also to be able to report to our funding agents uh, that we are providing quality work. So if you could take a moment to click on the link and provide some feedback.
other than that, I am going to turn off our recording and I thank you all for participating and taking a bit of your time this afternoon.